I'm going to explain why companies are wasting this amount of money, that's $11 trillion every year by getting it wrong. And I'm going to explain. $11 trillion is the same amount as the national debt for the US, just to give you an idea. That's a lot of money. Um, and I'm going to explain to you why the way that most companies approach change is completely balked and why it's really important that we start to do something about it. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about me. Before the UN, um, so basically, when digital arrived, I just started trusting my intuition and doing stuff. And some things were total failures, and other things worked really well, but that was fine. So in 1998, I um, brought together an event that had artists and researchers and industry people to try and figure out what will digital mean, what does convergence mean? And then in 1999, I managed to persuade the BBC to give us a half a million quid to curate, um, to commission some interesting content for their new website because they didn't have any clue how to get people to it. Um, because none of us really knew what we were doing and because I wanted to make sure that the artists had the best chance of doing something amazing, I wrote a thing into their contract which was that they had to come to like an open session during their development. So they had to, <coughs> terrifyingly, they had to stand up and go, this is my pitch, I know it's not ready yet, this is what I've been commissioned to do. And we'd have like 100 people in the room with them from all sorts of different sectors, from media, from advertising, from technology. They'd do their pitch and then the people in the audience would feed back, you could do it much better if you did it like this. And it was awesome. So that became part of the way we did things. Um, then we did the very first open innovation competition for Hewlett-Packard Labs, um, which actually is the model, um, the guys who set up 100% open were our funders in that, so that's why they opened 100% open after that. The open innovation model became part of everything I do. And then I started doing these multidisciplinary workshops because to me, we're dealing with these incredibly complex problems and the best way to solve them is to zoom out see what the ecosystem is, find people in those ecosystems and bring them together to co-design the solutions because you might end up with solutions that will work. Um, and then I did the thing which I guess was probably most proud of in my entire career, which was called Back to X, which was connecting 16 physical events, 15 in schools, uh, with thousands of online participants in a live gener generative experience. Um, and then this happened. I got headhunted to lead a massive transformation project for the UN. And my job was to drag them into the digital age. And kicking and screaming, they came with me somehow. And it was really painful and really hard. But I'm going to tell you what we did. So essentially, I've learned that if you don't get commit from, commitment from the top, you may as well just forget, forget it. My boss would not introduce me to the sec gen, so I basically just went to see the sec gen. So I'm sat in an oak panelled office with him, um, and I basically said to him, this is how we need to do things. I need you to do two things. I got him into a TV studio to record a video of a script that I wrote. I took the video and then put the video on YouTube because I knew as soon as he'd done that, he couldn't really back down. <laughs> And the second thing I said was, I'm going to use your name. Every now and again, I'm going to be in difficult situations, and I need to say, you're my sponsor. And because I'd explained to him, uh, to him as a politician, the last thing we did was to bring 10,000 kids around 7,500 people in Geneva. I was going, think about what this is going to mean for you as a politician. So you need to figure out what's in it for them. Um, shared purpose piece. You'd think at the UN that would be quite simple, but actually... Um, the culture was a little bit political and not terribly collaborative. You may not be surprised about that. So um, to get people working together, I came up with this idea, which was a co-created manifesto. And the idea was that everybody who got involved in the project over the year would together design this thing, which was a manifesto for change. The device itself wasn't so important, but it was the fact that it got people to think together towards something which was really important, like, why are we doing this? So that kind of worked. Um, the crowdsourcing piece, there was no social media. There's social media policy, bearing in mind this was the International Telecommunications Union. <clears throat> so from a standing start, <laughs> and having been told that I wasn't allowed to tweet about anything I was doing there, and going, you don't tell me what, to do, what I do in my personal channels. 
Uh, we had two open innovation competitions, which was from my toolkit, which was engaging the startup community. We started doing collaborative design workshops um, with internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Um, we had this beautiful project which asked kids across the world in schools to kind of have little workshops and um, feed into a wiki about how technology could change the world. And actually getting kids involved in a situation is awesome because it just gets people to focus on the really important stuff, which is the future. And then, like I say, we got to the end of it uh, when we did this thing which was called a meta-conference. So we had 7,500 people in Geneva uh, and 10,000 kids across the world. Um, so the kids kind of ran the conversation. So you get like a kid in New York asking a question on Twitter of the richest person in the world. So it just leveled the entire conversation, which was awesome. Um, before I got to any of that, I had to figure out who the change agents are. Um, so basically, I just shamelessly networked and got out there and actually got into fair amounts of trouble for networking because that isn't the way they did things. But as soon as you can figure out who you're like-minded, that seems very um, yeah relevant to today, you're my, my like-minded folk and you start to bring them together with you again and again so that they feel the change is theirs. When they go back into their departments, they, they become your internal evangelist. So without those change agents, it would never have worked. Um, Communications, my goodness, when I got there, the only internal communications they had were through these emails, and every single stakeholder across the whole organization wanted to say what they were doing. So the emails were a mile long, and uh, actually was nothing to do with the person who was reading it. They'd never even thought of it that way. It was just everybody wanted to say what they wanted to say. So we had to do a lot of work into how do you actually do user-focused, what's in it for me, interesting, short, snappy communications. That was not an easy task. Ah, oh, then there's the celebration piece. Now, there's bits of this story that I can't really tell you, but come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but um, we had a really small team. I had 30 people. It was a massive project. We had a sales and marketing team that weren't really sales or marketeers, and they had enormous targets. Um, and so I said to the boss, all we need to do is start rewarding them and recognizing them. So I managed to get him to agree to buying a bell. So every time anybody in any of our teams just made the smallest win, he'd ring the bell and we'd all go to his office. So we got to know each other better. Sometimes we'd like have a bottle of champagne or... So that worked really well. And, you know, it's, it's the little things that make a really big difference when it comes down to it. Um, yeah, so that's something I think we should all bear in mind and it's something that I keep reminding myself on a daily basis. There is no right way and there is no wrong way. There's always a better way. Anyway, after I'd gone through the pain of that scenario, I started understanding that if I started to understand the human brain better, then I'd understand better how to help people through the pain of change. Um, and, it was, uh, and, and, and actually, when you start looking at the way that our brains work, um, you start to understand how difficult it is to get, from, get to this dream state, which everybody, every company wants to get to. They want to be efficient. They want to have collaborative leaders. They want innovation cultures. They want to be competitor aware. And this is where most of them are. They're totally fragmented. They're still navel-gazing. They've got no clue what's going on in the outside world. Um, and the change from one to the other is really, really difficult. And we're back to this number. And the fact that we have to change... It's, that's not an option. The fact that we're doing change wrong is an option. And this is the amount of money that companies waste. How? And it comes as no surprise. When I go through these figures, you'll go, meh, for sure. But it took me a while to get this together. Oh, that's very small. OK, so 90% uh, of M&As fail. So if then you look at the figures. And then talent mismatch is extraordinarily expensive. And that's how much it costs on a yearly basis. Uh, technology deployment, 70% plus of them fail. That costs that much. And then there's the un un unhappy customer switching, and much of that is to do with the fact that people inside companies are unhappy. So the reason we're losing the money is because companies are made up of people. People don't like change. We can't do change to people. We need to do it with them. So what's happening now is people are resisting and disengaging. Here's a figure. 13% of the worldwide workforce is engaged with their jobs. That means 87% of people who are going in and really don't care about their jobs. What does that mean? Just for the FTSE 500, they employ 48 million people. 
So that means that 41.7 million people are going into their jobs on a daily basis, not really caring about what they're doing. Now, when you think about how important it is for a human being to have purpose, that's shocking. We need to do something about it. This is the way that people normally handle change, through mandate, I tell you, you've got to do it. OK, no, not really. Um, silence, so they don't explain why they're doing what they're doing. Um, statistics, everything's run on spreadsheets. We all know what the problem there is. And this is what happens. So every time you try and do change to people, it has a reaction on people. So we've got two key states. One of them, I'm really sorry about these photographs, but that is what I found at the time. Um, the reward state um, is the state that we evolved so we could keep societies together. In the reward state, we're collaborative and we're innovative and we're social and actually we're well. So that's really where all of our employees should be. But we've got seven times more neural pathways that are constantly looking for threat. So we're actually looking for threat six times every second. And we, you know, we evolved in a time where it was really important if we were getting attacked by an animal, it was kind of more important to run away from that thing than it was to collaborate and innovate. So every time we bring a new technology, a new way of working, bring in a new m and all of these things that we keep doing to our people, they immediately go into fight or flight or threat mode. So that means every time you throw change at somebody, you're making them more and more resistant and more ill and more unhappy. It's not a good state. You can fix it. So these are the six triggers that help people be in a, the reward state. And if you think about the ways that most companies operate, it's exactly the opposite, opposite of what we do. Empathy, just listen to people, give people a voice. Certainty, let them know where you're going. If you know, it's like, let's look back to the savannah. If I'm in the savannah and I can see it for a really long way and I know what's going to be coming at me, that's a much better situation than something just suddenly appearing. So let people know where you are. Respect, give them a voice, listen to them, let them have an opinion. Um, autonomy, nobody likes to be micromanaged every... Well, we all know what it feels like to be micromanaged. It's not good. Fairness, people like to know why you've made decisions. So just be clear with the people who are working for you why things are happening. Um, and the last thing is connectedness. And most companies that I've worked with tend not to be so comfortable with that or they don't know how to make that happen. Um, so my kind of premise is, and what, what, I'm do, what I do and what the company does, is we've got a particular way, which is listen to the people across your organisation. Every single one of them has got something to say. And if you're not listening to them, it doesn't mean that they're not talking. I did a project yesterday, which was quite difficult, because actually they'd never given a platform for people to talk, to talk before. But it's so empowering when you let people talk. And then once you've figured out exactly who your change agents are, who's got something to say, who wants something to say, and you figured out what your challenges and opportunities are, bring those change agents together into these multidisciplinary workshops, and then they own the change. You're not doing it to them, they feel like they're part of it. So when they go back to their part of the organisation, they become the advocates for the change. And eventually, over time, it changes. And then, once you've got people excited and you've brought them into a co-creation workshop and they're, yay, we're part of this change, you need to keep them connected. I, I, went, I did a project recently with a big pharmaceutical company and we had 150 leaders, four days, got them to understand it was nothing to do with digital, it was nothing to do with technology, it's about behaviour and behaviour change. Got them all super excited. President stands up at the end and goes, this was transformational, we can do this. And then, of course, they all go back to their bits of the organisation and they've got no way of talking to each other, and that's not good. You need to make sure that people can carry on talking. This is what I think we should be moving towards. It took me ages to write these down, but I think there's, we need to be moving work into being more about being there. Rather than working for a living, we should be working because it's something we feel proud of. So this is the company I want to build. You know, we shouldn't be talking about work. We should be talking about passion and purpose. We shouldn't be hiding stuff. It doesn't help anything. We should be open. Um, we shouldn't be trying to make people dependent on us. We should be making ourselves redundant so that people are free and empowered. We should stop talking about I, start talking about we. I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, 
essentially we need to change the way that we run our companies. And so there are the 10 steps to change. I know you had 10 steps to innovation, Tiffany. I haven't seen your slides, but I'm looking forward. Um, commitment, buy-in from the top, and that means real buy-in from the top. Purpose, make sure that people are working together towards something. What's your why? Uh, investment, the worst thing you can do is to start doing something half-baked. You need to make sure you've got resource in for long enough for it to really make a difference. Crowdsource ideas, opinions. You, there is so much to be learned from your workforce, and yet people don't really listen. Discover your change agents. Use every opportunity of change, rather than it being a sort of a coffin for your organisational, um, a nail for your organisational coffin. Use every single change initiative as an opportunity to bring those change agents together to help you fix stuff. And communicate. There's nothing worth. You know, it's, it's so much better if you just keep making sure people know what's going on, who's saying what. Just keep communicating. Co-creation, talked about. If you co-create with people, it means they've got skin in the game. Then it's their change, not yours. Empower them. Make sure that, as I said, you don't end up kind of getting people excited and then they go back and they get told they can't do things. Give them an opportunity to try and change things from where they are. And keep reporting. It's really important. If you've said you're going to do something, keep giving them updates so that they know where you are in the process and feel that there's actually a change happening. And celebrate. You know, get the bell. Do whatever it is. Reward, recognise. Make people feel like everything they're doing is worthwhile, which, of course, it is, because actually companies are made up of people. And most importantly, there's no right way. There's always a better way. So just keep learning from what goes right and what goes wrong and just be honest about the failings. That's me.